Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Strategic Negotiations, with Patricia Lin, CCIM, Principal and Founder of Link Strategies and Exceed CE, and instructor with CCIM Institute. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors for, of the chapters in these regions. It's with your year-round support that we are able to bring you programming like this and all of our exceptional events that you've come to rely on. We'll begin this se session promptly at 10 a.m. Thanks again to all of our chapter sponsors. Our webinar, Strategic Negotiations with Patricia Lynn, CCIM, is about to begin. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Marina Hammersmith, and I'm the chapter president for Central Arizona CCIM. Welcome to today's webinar, Strategic Negotiations. Joining us for today's discussion is Patricia Lin, CCIM, Principal and Founder of Link Strategies and Instructor with CCIM. Patricia is going to take us through an interactive overview of the CCIM Institute's three-step interest-based negotiations model and provide you with practical tools that you can use right away both personally and professionally. P please feel free to ask questions throughout using the Q&A tab. We'll be answering as many as we can at the end of this discussion. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to help with that. We have experts on board. This recording and the accompanying presentation will also be available after the session. Patricia, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so pleased to have you. Thank you, Marina, and thank you, everyone, um, for joining us uh, this morning. I think most of you, it's still morning. I'm delighted to be here um, with you and really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. And we are going to guarantee that it's worth your while. Um, also would like to thank Holly Buchanan for conceiving of this idea and kicking it off and um, Marina and um, our superheroes behind the scenes in Chicago. So um, 
a, a couple of logistics. You have some handouts that you received should have been yesterday. If you haven't downloaded those, go ahead and download them or pull them up on your screen. We'll be using them during this session. Also, slides and uh, the recording of the session will be sent to you afterwards. So, uh, so you'll be able to rewind Patricia if you would like a little bit later. A uh, little bit about me before we start. Uh, you've received the bio, but as it relates to this content, uh, I have been in all aspects of the real estate field. I grew up in the brokerage business, and then after a short stint um, at uh, one of the big four accounting firms, I started my own consulting firm. I advise brokers, I advise corporations, I advise landowners and developers, government entities, nonprofits. So I've pretty much seen negotiations from all aspects of the real estate business. And a few years ago also, because there was no content out there um, in continuing education for commercial brokers started an online continuing education company. So that's the background. Let's jump into um, our course here. So back up a minute. Uh, this is called strategic negotiations. However, um, I would like to also call this how to get what you need and sustain long-term relationships because we are in a relationship business. I go to China to teach and I love to negotiate in China. Um, we are not negotiating for chopsticks. We are not buying a car. We are dealing with people who we will continue to deal with. And those of you who've been around the industry for a while know that you never burn your bridges and you try to maintain a relationship because you're always going to see someone in another position later. So that's why the emphasis on long-term relationships. Uh, for those of you who have taken the CCIM negotiation course, this might be a little bit of a refresher for you. It's always good to review the three-step process we're going to be talking about. For those of you who haven't taken a negotiation course with us, um, this is an overview of the commercial real estate negotiations, which we have as a separate course, and then we weave into the content of our CI 103 and 104. Let's start with a poll. And I wanna say before I launch the poll that this is anonymous. <laughs> so go ahead and feel free to check whatever is appropriate as it relates to you and the poll. Answers are coming in. Looks like if I were narrating a horse race, it looks like buyers, sellers taking the lead with other brokers coming up behind and oh, spouses and significant others, a close third. We have about 70% of you have chimed in. We'll wait another 20 seconds or so. <clears throat> Give us a couple more votes here. <clears throat> okay, so, um, and polling here, we've got about 72% have voted. Uh, so what we see is most of you are looking at buyers and sellers as 39%, other brokers as 20%. And interesting, I've got alarm going off just a second here. <laughs> there we go. Interesting 
that um, spouses and significant others, 20%. So um, this is a change from a few months ago when we were on lockdown and everyone was in the mode with their children, having to negotiate with them and um, also with their significant others. So it looks like we're back to business as usual. Awesome. 39% um, uh, buyers and sellers. Now, um, the reason for launching this poll wasn't just to say, uh, we want to make sure you're here and have you, are you paying attention? It's not that. The reason is that um, what we're going to discuss today applies to all aspects of our lives. And this process will help you not only with the real estate industry and those issues that you deal with, but also non-real estate negotiations as well. So um, let's get on with it. Now, traditionally, this is how we see negotiations, isn't it? We often look at negotiations as a necessary evil, um, a zero sum game, a winner, a loser. We're employing tactics to knock the other person off of dead center in order to get what we want. And even now that may be rather harsh, but even though we consider ourselves a win-win negotiator, sometimes there is just this default pattern that says, um, we want to win. We want that one upsmanship. We want to ensure that we get the best of the other, other party. So mindset um, is usually negotiations. They're tough. Um, it's adversarial. Um, so I want to show you this quote. Uh, Without changing our pattern of thought, we will not be able to solve the problems we created with our current patterns of thought. Isn't that appropriate for today's world? Um, I wish that I had been mm, smart enough to, to come up with this, but I must attribute it to Albert Einstein. So the reason that I like this quote is it sets a backdrop for how we can take a fresh approach to how we consider negotiations. And changing our patterns of thought changing our mindset is, is difficult and it takes a constant um, uh, viewing of that. Even in our one day negotiations course, where we spend the whole time talking about a process and how to understand the other people's needs, when we get our class into a negotiation, um, it's just natural to default into that mindset. So I'm spending a little bit more time up front to say, let's look at the concept of negotiations with a bit of a different perspective. Um, during the last six months or so when we've been in lockdown and um, had an opportunity to uh, spend a little bit more time actually reading, I've been reading about the ancient philosophers, um, particularly a group called the Stoics. And they developed their philosophy around the um, third, uh, third century BC. So we have, um, there have been some writings from the Stoics. They have four basic um, philosophies um, or ideals that they adhere to, but they were a group who endured tremendous hardship, plague, bankruptcy, um, political intrigue. And what they talked about in their writings is that we don't have the choice in terms of what happens to us, but we do have the choice of how we deal with it. And so I like that for our negotiation process because we don't always have the choice because we can't control other people of what the negotiation looks like, but we do have the ability to view it differently and um, take a perspective that allows us to take control over it. So um, let's launch into some content here. You have, you should have received, I noticed that a couple of you did not, but maybe you can take a picture of the screen. Um, uh, 
you should have received this three-step negotiation worksheet. What I'd like you to do with it is I would like you to think about a current negotiation underway. Not a past negotiation, but a current one. And even if it's not a real estate negotiation, but it's um, something else that's bothering you that you're dealing with, go ahead and write that down. Write that down, please. Take a minute to do that right now. And logistics wise, a um, number of you uh, have had me in a course, you know that my style in the classroom is very interactive. This isn't just me talking to you. Like you to participate, feel free to move into the chat. But by filling this out, um, it helps to engage your thought process about the steps that we're going to go through. All right. What we're going to do in the next 45 minutes now is we're going to address why we feel so strongly about the interest-based negotiation approach. We're going to give you an introduction into the three-step negotiation process. And then we're going to have some uh, practical applications uh, from experience woven into the three steps and then also some time for Q&A. So if you have questions, you can type the questions into the Q&A and Marina will be monitoring those. Now, in the chat, type in what current negotiations are keeping you awake at night by type, by type of negotiation. Go ahead, just into the chat window. This will help me. Okay, lease renewal, retail, commissions, always commissions, lease, hire an agent or not. Okay, any more? Restaurant, rent abatement, that always comes up. Getting my kids to do their homework. Uh, convince someone to sell, tenant shut down by governor's orders. Oh, tough. Retail lease negotiations. Great. Uh, dealing with contractors. Yep, 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 yep. Commissions, okay. Conditional use permit, TIs, super. Stubborn landlords not wanting to compromise, we'll deal with them. <laughs> okay, those are all terrific. All right, so let's, let's um, thank you very much. Let's deal with um, why we feel so strongly about our approach. And that is that there are a lot of challenges in the industry. You just listed them in your chat. Um, there are specific challenges unique to a relationship-oriented business. And some of us just, the concept of being better organized in very complex situations. Um, the tools we're going to use are a great approach for generating consensus among clients and helping us to be organized. And we like the tools that we're going to use because we're a quant organization, basically. We teach numbers, right? And so these aren't ethereal concepts of how to get into what somebody's feeling when they're negotiating. These are hard, concrete, steps in a process that we can go through that help us to organize ourselves. So some of the challenges uh, that we face right now. Uh, our clients know everything. All the information they need is available on the internet. Um, so they become more demanding and that even relates to fee compression, doesn't it? Um, our deals have many, many, many players. And um, when I was in the mm, brokerage business and I would deal with a corporation, it felt like I would take this proposal and I would lob it over this big, high, impenetrable, velvet, thick curtain and never know what was over on the other side. 
And um, then I'd sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. Well, what's going on on the other side is all the complexities of the organization is spinning around <laughs> before they can respond to me. Um, Non-monetary issues we'll talk about a little bit. And then, um, of course, the difficult negotiators always all represent a challenge. I uh, want to dive a little bit deeper into some more of the challenges. Um, I've spent the last, as a corporate real estate consultant, the last mm, 15, 15 years, um, maybe a little bit more, 20 years beyond that, um, working with companies as it relates to corporate policy around um, home officing. And we found that most um, corporations use about, mm, their space is occupied about 40% of the time. So we started working on work from home. Um, we did space studies, utilization studies, location, measuring productivity, um, huge analyses. Um, and I found that there was, was uh, nothing happened unless it was almost like everybody held hands and sang kumbaya to get the corporation to move forward. Now, all of a sudden, um, that's all out the door. <laughs> and so we've had to have new corporate policies. They're moving as they start moving people back in. Um, they have to have a certain amount of distancing. And so consensus is almost that the companies will be using the same amount of space as opposed to reducing their space from the targeted 300 square feet per um, FT full-time employee to 80 or so, which was what the mantra was before. So um, corporate policy is difficult and challenging. And we find that we need to address everybody's needs. Um, I love this flow chart as it relates to building consensus. So take a look at that. You see discussion, proposal, um, test for consensus. It goes left to no, but it doesn't go right to yes. Um, and it's a little tongue in cheek, but the idea is that usually there isn't consensus. And so you have to go through this process of addressing everyone's concerns. So when I was lobbying that proposal over the curtain, on the other side, they were doing this and they were doing this and trying to build consensus so that they could respond. That is a challenge for us in our environment and with what we do. Anybody deal with a difficult negotiator? You can chat into the chat room. Yes, no. Anybody, I'll, I'll ask like this, has anybody not dealt with a difficult negotiator? Bullies. <laughs> anybody else? Never not dealt with a difficult negotiator. Hal says they're all tough. Uh, Morgan comes with the territory, or Rick comes with the territory. All right, there's a corporate. Ah, okay. Well, maybe, yes, 30 years of, I love it. <laughs> yeah, so all of these things that you're seeing in um, the chat window are what we encounter in um, our negotiations. Um, the attorney comment, um, yeah. Uh, we, we've seen that. I've also seen some attorneys who ha belie that, but um, all tough, all a little different. Okay, great. Uh, I like this screen. Thank you for that. I like this, this um, slide because it looks like they're two people speaking a different language. And this isn't just literally speaking a different language. This is... Um, perhaps not listening or not hearing the other person. Um, it all gets down to communication rather than just tossing a deal across. Um, there was a book in the 80s, the first great book I read about 
real estate negotiations. And it was called Winning Through Intimidation. Uh, it was a big deal real estate book with lots of um, oh, private jets and coming in with entourages with briefcases of cash and that sort of thing. Um, but there was a section on negotiators and how they steal your chips. And the first way that they would steal your chips was that they would come to you in a negotiation and say, I'm not gonna steal your chips. And they had no intention of stealing your chips, but they ended up stealing your chips. Well, this is the second way that they would steal your chips, which is, I have no intention of, I'm not gonna steal your chips. Here, let me shake your hand. And the other hand is behind with every intention of stealing your chips. So we have difficult negotiators to deal with. Out of all of these challenges are some opportunities um, that can help us to leverage relationships, uh, build relationships, and um, help build consensus, believe it or not, with all the situations that you raised in the chat window. Um, in terms of success of a negotiation. These are different ways that people say that they can measure success. Um, I'm gonna pick on one of them right now, which is avoiding conflict. Do you think we should avoid conflict in a negotiation? Yes, no, what do you think about conflict as it relates to a negotiation? Yeah, um, a lot of us don't like conflict. Um, and I've got some great answers. Uh, kill them with kindness, embrace it. Thanks, Tony. Um, can be good if not hostile. These are, these are terrific. It can get the negotiation moving. Um, conflict is, is tricky. Um, it, you must disclose the conflict as a diagnostic in order to determine where the issues are. It's a little bit like going to the doctor's office and um, dealing with the pain in your elbow. The doctor can't address the pain in your elbow unless you describe what it is. So the area where conflict gets tricky is what some of you have said, it turns into a debate with ego involved um, and you forget to keep your eye on the, on the target, which was find out what the issues are. Um, we like measuring success by assessing outcomes against internal goals. And um, Stephen Covey wrote a book years ago called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, and one of his seven habits was beginning with the end in mind. So when we think about our negotiation, we like thinking about what our goals are for that negotiation, both for ourselves and for the other party. Okay, relationship, substance, or both. Uh, there's a tension um, that we experience in professional relationships in terms of negotiating styles. And over here on the left, you see the relationship um, mode, very, very accommodating, um, conflict adverse. Um, and over on the substance mode, um, that is very competitive, take no prison prisoners. And so we have both of these. Uh, the relationship mode, I had a story of somebody I started in the business with and she went out and said, oh, the developer is going to give me the listing um, if I reduce the fee a lot. And um, I said, really? Well, yeah, but if I take that 90% reduction in the fee while he's trying me out, then he'll give me the other listings. Uh, sure. <laughs> well, she was in the business about... Um, five minutes, and um, but she was all about the relationship without bringing the conflict of pushing why, why she was 
um, offering valuable services. So we tend to compromise between the two, between the relationship mode and between the substance mode. And what we say is that by expanding the pie, there's something that we call the CCIM win-win zone. And we do that by focusing on their needs and our needs. And instead of compromising here, um, we expand that pie. Um, we sometimes call it accretive negotiations rather than distributive negotiations um, using some creativity. Okay, well, what's that mean? Hmm. Um, you may have heard this story about the orange and two sisters were inviting or fighting over the last orange. Um, Becky and Melissa both wanted the orange and they were in the other room, everybody was locked down and um, mother comes along and says, I'm tired of this, um, I'm going to just cut the orange in half. And still the girls aren't happy. So mother says, um, what's the problem here? Um, you know, you each got some of the orange, that's the best that we can do with what we have. And Becky says, well, um, I didn't want the whole orange, I just wanted to eat the fruit. And Melissa says, well, I didn't want the fruit, I didn't need this half with all the fruit in it, I just wanted the skin um, for orange zest to uh, make a cake that I wanted. So if mother had asked the question, we might have had a different scenario um, in terms of how they both got more of what they wanted and expanded that pie. I know with adults here, I should make that a story about margaritas, but um, anyway, there you are. Okay, uh, Stephen Covey again. When you show deep empathy towards others, their defensive energy goes down and positive energy replaces it. That's when you get to, this is what I like about this quote, more creative in solving problems. Okay, we've got a little game here. Marina, um, are you there? I am here, I'm coming. I have a deal for you. Um, I have a deal for you. Corner, Marina lives in the Scottsdale area. Corner, Scottsdale and Camelback. And um, it's not on the market yet. Its value is about 15 million, but today for you, I'm going to offer 10 million. Mm -hmm. It's a real deal. And yeah. I think you should just decide on it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, have you, I don't know if you've seen the traffic counts there. I know what you're talking about. It's hidden, it's kind of tucked behind the frontage. I, know it, I think, look, you're 5 million tops. 5 million. Phew. Okay. Well, let's see, where am I? I'm at 10. How about if I come down to nine? Yeah, I, yeah, I, it, no signage opportunity, parking's terrible. I, I just, yeah, I appreciate what you're saying, but you know, maybe, you know, maybe we're six, but yeah, we're, six. we're far apart here. Yep. Okay. Uh, nine, eight, eight. Best deal. Yeah, you really should take this. I mean, you really should take this. And um, I, I just think you'll be happy afterwards. And it's because you're a CCIM and our relationship, um, you know? Well, I, because you're a CCIM, I think we'll, you know, we'll come up to uh, four, four or five. Whew. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry. I, I think we're at an impasse. Um, I just, I, you know, it's really great, but... Okay, so Marina and I go back and forth a little bit more, and we go back and forth a little bit more, and then we end up, what do we end up doing? Splitting the difference, right? Does that look like a classic deal? Yeah. <laughs> I've done um, it to one or two. <laughs> yeah. So Marina, how do you feel after negotiating like that? It's, um, it's exhausting, really. I mean, I think we probably both thought that there was maybe middle ground that we could reach and we just jockeyed back and forth and it was exhausting and it probably didn't do much for our relationship. Yep, we cut our fees, um, yeah. you know, we, which we had to do to make this work and um, neither of us are walking away happy. 
So classic, this is the kind of negotiating that destroys relationships. And um, this is not, and it takes two to play in it. This is not our model. Our model says that we have a way to avoid this game. And does anybody um, want to chat in the window? It's a three letter word of how to avoid this high-low game. A three letter word that lets you avoid this game. <laughs> oh, Robin. <laughs> so my friend Robin says, ask the question, why? Ask, Kevin says, ask better communication. It all gets down to asking the question, why? How come? Um, what is it that you need? Why is it that you feel that the property is only worth this amount? Um, so just a little bit more on the high-low game. When we play that game, um, it becomes a battle of wills. Um, as Marina says, it damages relationships and um, may ignore some issues. So this gets to the heart of the CCIM negotiation program and the basic premise, which is people will make decisions on their own interest. Um, the way to find creative ways to, um, the key to successful negotiation is creative ways to satisfy those interests, at, which are non-negotiable, um, and then understand what all the alternatives are before you reject or accept a deal. So that leads us to the three-step negotiation process. And um, the three steps arise out of those three premises. Um, I'll dig deeper into how they look, but you can see them here. Who are the parties, what actions, and what happens if there's no agreement? So our assumption, we stated, people make decisions on their interests. So the step is what we call a stakeholder interest chart. It's the best tool um, I've seen in, in our program um, as it relates to getting a deal done. Um, we have to find creative ways to solve their interest. So our second step is to brainstorm actions. And then we need to understand or conduct a risk analysis, what happens if there is no deal. So in looking at step one, of the three-step process. This is that stakeholder interest chart. Um, the way that I use it is most of the time in my head until it gets complicated. But you can see across the top are stakeholders, um, what their issues are, and then in the middle, we're going to add their interests. So the first thing we do is we identify who the stakeholders are. This is a just sample deal. Um, what the issues might be. And then in the middle is what each stakeholder feels about each of the respective interests. So um, to bring this to life, and you also have a stakeholder interest chart as part of your handout, but uh, to bring this to life, a real life case study, names have been changed and locations to protect the parties. Um, this was a family, third generation family. Um, they're civic leaders, great family in the community, uh, made many contributions, uh, but the highest and best use of their property was no longer farming. So they hired me as a consultant to help them um, deal with the city and to find a developer. We, visited projects all over the country. Uh, we took about a year in the planning um, before we sent out an RFP. We narrowed down the developer selection process and we spent eight months negotiating with two top law firms in Southern California. Um, we, at that point, and about $300,000 into it in legal fees, reached an impasse. The issue was over control. So, here is how we worked out that um, 
the stakeholder interests here. We had the three siblings and the developer. We had the issues, uh, decision control, their family legacy, pro, uh, profit project aesthetics, and then um, the developer fee. And so what you do when you fill out a stakeholder interest chart is um, you fill the chart out across for each of the issues. So for decision control, um, red meant uh, opposite from everybody else, since these didn't have different colors attributed to them. Um, they were different, but not opposite. Uh, family legacy, the developer did want to support the family legacy. Uh, the lead uh, sibling who um, I dealt with um, wanted to ensure that was very important to her. Um, profit, um, one of the, the brother maximized, developer maximized their profit. Project aesthetics, um, we want best practice. We want this to be a model community. Their comment was we don't want ticky tacky houses like have been developed through the rest of the of the community. We want something that that makes this community um, stand apart. Um, and then the developer fee minimize, minimize, um, eliminate and then maximize. So that was the stakeholder interest chart. And you can see that where we had absolute conflict um, was on the decision control and the developer fee. So um, what's beautiful about this chart is that you also have um, an opportunity to see and emphasize where there is alignment. So for just the two issues that had conflict, there are a number of issues where everyone is actually in alignment. So with your stakeholder interest chart, you might think about what these, these issues are. Questions, do you need them if it's just a two-party negotiation? Um, I'm trained to always think about this in my head. Um, but often it's never just a two party uh, negotiation. Usually there's somebody else lurking in the background. You've, you've probably found that when somebody comes to you the next day and something's changed. Uh, and, but it's great when deals get um, too complicated to write this all out. Uh, sometimes I've even sat everyone down in a room and used it in that way and written everything out. Uh, let's talk about interests a little bit because you're going to be filling this chart in. We go into the types of um, interest um, and positions, and I like um, I like this as a uh, picture of positions at the top and interests below the surface. And what you see is rookie negotiators tend to negotiate positions, um, time, price, back and forth. Um, the experienced negotiators uh, are the ones who do what Robin said and ask that question, why? What's beneath the surface that is causing them to drive their positions? This one's, <laughs> this one's kind of fun. We have to entertain ourselves. Um, the guy at the top, hmm, looking around and the fish below. If only look down here and listen to our interests, sigh. So um, thinking about what the interests are is going to help you to, um, to be creative in solving your problems. Uh, when you fill out the form, it might be a good idea to, to take a picture of this um, because it's very powerful. On the issue of timing, what does Bill need? And that helps you to complete the interest chart in the middle. Um, what this also does is it helps with relationship building. Back to what Stephen Covey said is when you are asking questions that demonstrate that you care or are concerned, it helps to build trust. And so the relationship building and talking about their interests and 
focusing on their needs and getting information directly through them helps to establish, um, establish a basis, but also it is statistical in that you have data that comes from your clients as well or the stakeholders as well. Step two of the three-step negotiation process is what uh, we call brainstorm actions. How can we get them what they need so we can get what we want? And what we call actions are possible options for satisfying interests through a negotiated agreement. We have a lot of fun with this in our course. Um, we, we actually make it a contest, but in the, um, in the real world, it's great to brainstorm and take the interest chart and have everybody, have the help from people who have different perspectives, uh, come up with ideas that meet all of the needs. So what's that look like with our case study? Okay, so here's the stakeholder interest chart. What action steps can be proposed to satisfy these needs? Um, here you are. So these are some that we came up with. We could develop an oversight committee with a tiebreaker from the independent party to our new, other new urbanist communities throughout the country, conduct a community forum to get input um, that dealt with project aesthetics, um, hire an independent consultant on market command to help with our financial analysis and our feasibility study, hire um, a law firm to amend the EIR to increase density to reflect uh, the new urbanist concept, which is higher density in a central location and then lower density um, in the uh, peripheral areas or community areas, uh, create a project theme, enhance a waterfall for profit to developer. So those two um, non-negotiable or those two red items, profit, we dealt with by creating a, a uh, profit waterfall for the develop with certain benchmarks criteria for uh, success criteria. And then the oversight committee uh, dealt with that issue of control. So this was a great solution that helped us to break that eight month impasse. Um, to wrap up this part about the three steps, if you don't get what you want, it's a sign that you did not seriously want it or that you tried to bargain over the price. So who do you think said that? <laughs> it wasn't Albert Einstein. It was actually Rudyard Kipling, who I just thought was a, a fiction writer. Um, a brief, I, I spoke too soon. I wasn't wrapped up on the three-step process. I was wrapped up on one and two, but a brief overview of the risk analysis. And that is that you must consider the consequence of no agreement. Now, why is that so important? We're all in, you know, we wouldn't be in the real estate business if we weren't optimistic and enthusiastic. Um, why do we need to consider um, what happens if there's no agreement? Anybody? That means chime into the chat. <laughs> well, one is I might not get paid. Maintain relationships. We'll go with we'll go with those. Um, no one's happy, yeah, everybody loses if we don't have a deal. Um, there's something also that no agreement means you have to start over, you have to be willing to walk away. It's always one of the potential outcomes, even though we don't like to think that no agreement is a potential outcome. Um, the process of looking at no deal helps us to define better what our bottom line is when faced with the idea 
that we might not reach an agreement, maybe our bottom line shifts a bit, possibly. Um, and you've probably heard this concept called BATNA. Well, BATNA is a little bit different, but it's the concept of best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In other words, how have we changed our bottom line or modified it? Um, consequence of no agreement. Um, we originally called this fighting alternatives um, because at some point when a conflict escalates, it eventually gets to some kind of fight being court, war, um, other things. So um, it can be called many things, but we must look at it consequences that may occur. So if there is no agreement, um, stakeholders may try to satisfy their own interests unilaterally or harm the interests of others. Um, so we must understand what they could do, um, unfriend you on Facebook, um, slander you, find another deal. We must think about that. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to give 30 seconds to tactics. Um, and that is that we understand that everybody uses tactics, but we don't teach tactics to be deployed in an interest based negotiation. What we do is we say, you must recognize them. You must know how to deal with them. Um, and once you generally call them on the tactic, then it's exposed. Um, so that's how we address tactics. We do have some fun with it in the class. Um, here is our summary now of the three-step process. And when you think about this as quantifiable steps, it helps to give you the ability to take control back over the process of the negotiation. Because people are involved, you can't necessarily control the outcome, but what you can control is that process. And you can do it in a data-driven, um, methodic manner um, that helps you to get to the place where you can be more creative in your solutions. So um, I targeted for 10 minutes for Q&A. So I think some of you have entered some questions into the Q&A. I think um, Marina might be Hi. going to tee those up. Yeah, we did. We got a great question, I think, uh, from Dimitri. Um, and Dimitri says, what if the other party uh, in the negotiation is lying about the why? And that seems very nefarious, but um, uh, I've, I've come across that in my own dealings. Like, it, you know, somebody was deceitful about, about the underlying issue there. It's, mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, there are lots of ways to find out if someone is lying. Um, and um, some of it is research. You know, there's a lot of research available that, that um, uh, and now allows us to um, perform some, uh, you know, behind the scenes, get some behind the scenes information. Some of it is, this um, sounds a little California or whatever, but some of it's body language. And um, can you, sometimes you can tell whether people are lying just by looking at signals that they might give. Um, the other is we have a great tool in the uh, commercial real estate negotiations course called Numeral. And that's um, a questioning new mnemonic um, needs urgency, motivation, expectations, resources, authority, loyalty. Usually if you ask enough questions, um, you can start to get a little bit deeper than what they may have uh, initially said. Does that help? 
Yeah, I, I think it does. Um, and I guess I have a I have a question. There's a few more coming through and I'll ask them real quick. But my question to dovetail on that is then when you find out that you are dealing with someone who's got, you know, nefarious intentions or they're misleading you on the why, how do you deal with that? I mean, now you know there is an issue. There wasn't you know, right. So you've addressed that, but how do you how do you really like hit do you hit it hit the nail on the head? What do you do? Yeah. Um, I, again, uh, you know, there, there's a lot that says you just deal with it head on. I yeah. mean, I, I, there's a lot of um, reason to just just deal with that. Um, you don't have to say you liar, you know, <laughs> like that. But you can say, well, um, you know, I I did read something about your company, and and I I saw that. Um, maybe they were reducing a number of locations rather than expanding. So, you know, that old Columbo where he'd walk out the door and turn around and say one more thing. Um, so, so there are ways to address that. And I think that's a matter of personal style, quite frankly, yeah. what you feel comfortable um, with. Got it. Um, so Demetra, I'm going to get to you in just a second. Um, We've got, how do you deal with people who are simply greedy and unprofessional? Sure. Um, well, unprofessional can go in a lot of different directions. Um, greedy, um, you know, it, it's just a frank discussion about what you want and what I want and um, what your needs are and digging a little deeper beyond just the pricing. And I know that sounds real easy, but also when you throw, and it's not, when you throw in the step three um, of what happens if we don't do this deal um, yeah. and your willingness to not do the deal, um, then perhaps that allows them and finding other way to meet their interests other than price. It's back to that old, if you're just negotiating over price. And the best way I saw anyone ever deal with a step three was um, Steve Jobs, uh, shortly before he passed away, was trying to get the Apple um, headquarters building approved in the city of Cupertino. And there are some YouTube videos of him at city council and he was getting some, or planning department, I think he was getting some opposition and he just walked in and he said, you know, I, um, I grew up in these streets. I kicked the ball down the middle of the streets and rode my bicycle under these trees. And I love this community. And I really would hate to remove our company from its tax base. And, and he said very sincerely, um, but you know, that was the step three. So stop being so greedy about um, incentives that were being in, uh, extracted. I see you've got about seven lined up, so I'm going to stop on that one. <laughs> yep. Yeah, okay. Um, so Dimitri also says then, uh, let's say you get caught in a lie and the trust is broken. Where do you go from there? Um, it, it, it's difficult to rebuild trust um, once somebody has been caught in a lie, but um, you can continue to set ground rules. Um, if that has been exposed, it's out in the open, then you reestablish ground rules, determine the importance of um, continuing that relationship um, toward whatever its objectives are. Um, and, and then uh, speaking rather generically, I would say reestablish the ground rules. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so from Jacob, Jacob, uh, what is a good way to ensure an accommodating strategy to build relationships won't create a precedent for the opposing party to base future deals off of, right? I get that. So, so setting the precedents for future, I, you gave on this here, so you have yeah, to yeah. give on that there, right? Sure. Um, there's a, um, there's a general guideline, um, uh, when you're negotiating one deal, which is you, uh, click off all of the terms of the deal, but you start 
that conversation with. Um, each one is independent and we don't reach an agreement on one until we've reached an agreement on all. Mm -hmm. So you set, and, and that's for deal points on one deal, but you set the parameters up front that um, and I don't know, it was Jacob, I think, I don't know what the specifics are, um, but you set the parameters up front so that, that this just applies to this deal. And make yeah, sure and so his, his, for instance, uh, was a developer example where the commission was reduced to earn the listing and then, then you know, that, that set precedent. So, um, you know, you might do that one off, but you wouldn't do that on a consistent basis. It's sort of like, you know, that lost leader, right? Yeah. Or you yeah. end up like my friend who's out of the business after a while. Yeah. So I would continue to go back and reestablish my value. And, and I never, I, I can't say never, but I, that's, that's where I didn't want to start in the negotiation is starting with taking a lower listing. Um, but so we, we cleared everything up to not set a precedent in the in the beginning. Yeah, that's good. That makes sense. Um, okay, Randy Mason says how to deal with a client that says they will accept a certain number and you get them a higher number and then they want more basically. Okay, so if you've got a listing, right? I got you this. Oh, now I, that's not good enough. Now I want more. That's never Randy, happened. you're a pro. You know how to <laughs> deal with that. I know, Randy. <laughs> no, no. Um, th that goes back to the greed question, really. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, every question that you ask, I can step back and look at um, our three-step process. And if there is some room in the interest. Look, we've met your interest here. Um, the possibility is if you go back and you want more, um, even though we've already addressed what you said you wanted, the possibility is that you could lose the transaction. So you perform the risk analysis, you inform them of that. So Randy, I would say you just keep coming back to um, getting under the surface and trying to address this issue in that way. And um, also, you know, if that's a tactic, only address it as a tactic. Okay. That makes Give me sense. one more, Holly. <laughs> okay. Holly or Marina, you me. Oh, okay. sorry. So that's Marina. okay. That's all right. Yeah, thank <laughs> I'll you. answer to anything. Um, John <laughs> Baker says, how do you deal with someone whose strategy is a scorched earth strategy, making it unprofitable per to pursue the negotiation? I haven't, I haven't heard that term before, scorched earth strategy. Yeah. Um, it reminds me a little bit of... Um, a question I had in a previous session where somebody said, how would you negotiate with the president? And I'm not, this is not a political conversation, but he's a tough negotiator. And, um, you know, my, my comment to the scorched earth is that sometimes there are people, I just, life is too short to, to negotiate with. And um, I know that if I'm going to get in a deal with them, it, I, I'm not going to be happy in the end. And so sometimes you have the choice of just don't. Also, um, if you know how to address tactics and that scorched earth is a tactic, um, then you can call them on the tactic and address that and say, look, what do you get, get again under the surface into the needs? So. I hope that was helpful. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, you will get these slides. Um, here is some fun reading. The blue ones are books that I've read that, that demonstrate different negotiating approaches. Um, the dark ones, the black or green, are um, a textbook style negotiations. And I want to make a, a shameless plug for the CCIM negotiation program, even if you're not a candidate or not in our program, the commercial real estate negotiations courses um, is a, a fabulous um, course. One of our instructors, Robin Dyke, is on this call. And uh, we've taken that um, into a one-day virtual course. And, 
and it's um, you wouldn't believe that you could have such an exciting course um, online. So uh, that's my my shameless plug for that. Um, I can be reached. At, that's my cell phone. Um, Exceed CE is my online CE company. Um, uh, proved in Washington, Oregon, and um, California and Hawaii, but not not Nevada or Arizona yet. So anyway, that's um, that's where I can be reached. And um, lastly, thank you very much. And for my Hawaii friends, <laughs> mahalo nui loa. Love okay. it. Patricia, you've been just amazing today. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your expertise. We so appreciate you. And um, to anybody who is uh, joining us who's not a CCIM, this is just the tip of the iceberg on some of the educational opportunities that are available through the Institute. So um, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you to our sponsors and uh, have a great day, everyone. Great, thanks and go forth and prosper. Okay, take care.